a little while ago, actually a bit of a time ago now, when I was doing some home visits, I came across a housebell man. It wasn't in this parish. It was in uh, Ramsgate. And he had been a lapsed Catholic for many years. Not that, un not that uncommon. And I explained to him how easy it would be as someone who was housebound to return to the sacraments. He could make a good confession and then I could begin to bring him Holy Communion at home. And he seemed to be very open to this. But then he remembered something and the look in his eyes changed. And he said, Father, that's not going to be possible because I have this, uh, this relation, this relative of mine. I think it was an in-law. And he said, I will never forgive him for the wrongs he has done me. What struck me from the conversation that followed as he tried to explain the litany of evils that the relative had done him was actually how trivial so much of it came down to. In terms of finance, maybe it was £100, some broken property, some wasted time, some storytelling about him. In his mind, however, the things were totally inflated. But looking at it rationally, the man was imprisoning himself in unforgiveness and resentments over a couple of small thefts he had suffered from, a, from an obnoxious relative who he hadn't seen in years. And he just couldn't budge from this unforgiveness. He couldn't let the matter go. He couldn't uh, leave it behind. But as you will all know, this kind of thing is tragically very, very common. Um, especially in families when there's money concerned or inheritance or perceived insults over children or someone's social standing. Maybe this man I've mentioned should be commended for being honest. He kind of had enough appreciation of Christianity to realize that his situation was serious that it barred him from being able to go to confession and receive Holy Communion. Our Lord makes that clear on a few occasions. He says, If you do not forgive the sins of your brother, your Heavenly Father will not forgive you your sins either. Unforgiveness for the sins someone else has done to you is like a blockage in the system of God's grace and mercy. So you can get on your knees all you like in the confessional and say sorry for your sins. But if you're harboring serious unforgiveness towards another, an unforgiveness that doesn't even want God's help to love the person, then you've got something that will block the power of the absolution. As the priest says in the name of Christ, the words of absolution, the presence of the unforgiveness in your heart blocks the absolution, like a blind blocking out, blocking out the light of the sun. But it can be really difficult to overcome this unforgiveness, that decision to hold another person's sins against them, the choice not to love the individual, to like hold on to the sin like a kind of rope around the person, like a chain, rather than letting go of the bond and of loving them in spite of what they have done, and asking God to bless them and show mercy on them. You know, we've all experienced this, that unforgiveness that kind of gnaws inside of you and says, I have been wronged. That person is guilty. He's my enemy. It's, it can be very difficult to move beyond that. But in all things, we need to look to the example of our Lord. And we are told about um, our Lord, that his forgiveness for us was incredible. St. Paul tells us in Ephesians, Be kind to one another, merciful, forgiving one another, even as God has forgiven you in Christ. If you want to see what the forgiveness of Jesus looks like, look at the cross. That's him forgiving us. That's the apology. That's him taking away our sins. And that's his response to our sin, to swallow it up in love and self-sacrifice. And St. Paul says that should be our model when it comes to trying to forgive others. Self-denial, sacrifice, humility, death to self. Forgive one another as God has forgiven you in Christ. 
Our Lord's teachings are also full of many exhortations to forgive others. And one of the best examples is today's Gospel. And it's such a wonderful parable. So wake up now if you've fallen asleep because it's, it's an amazing parable. The servant in the parable owes his master an extraordinary amount of money. 10,000 talents. And um, it sounds a bit geeky, but you can work out how much that is in today's money. 10,000 talents. That's because the Romans had a very particular way of paying people. Um, a laborer would get a denarius a day. You know, denarius means a day's wage. So every laborer would get a denarius a day. And so in a year, counting for holidays and stuff like that, a laborer would probably receive, let's say, 300 denarii a year. After 20 years, he would have amassed 6,000 denarii. Are you with me? That's 20 times 300. And supposing he never spent any of those wages at all, at that point... He would go, be able to go down to the bank and exchange that massive pile of denarii for one talent. So one talent is 6,000 days of work. So that means one talent is the equivalent of 20 years of work. And the man in the parable owed 10,000 times that. We're dealing with an incredible sum. It's like doing a standard job continuously for 200,000 years. In today's money, if we imagine maybe a 30,000 pound a year salary, it would be the equivalent of owing a billion pounds. So the servant owes a billion pounds to the master. It's a ridiculously large amount. And amazingly, in that parable, this servant who's so deeply in debt, he humbly gets on his knees and begs for mercy. And the amazing thing is, the master is moved with pity and forgives him. One billion pounds. You know, the servant could never have paid this. That's the point. You know, how he got into that amount of debt in the first place is a wonder in itself. But now here's a really surprising thing. The point of the parable is that you are that man. What do you mean? How can I be in that much debt? Actually, seriously, the parable is meant to be about us. Each one of us is meant to humbly appreciate, I am that person who finds himself in an extraordinary debt before God. We need this to sink down right inside of us. It changes so much about how we see God and how we experience what it's like to forgive somebody else. The fact is we are born as part of a sinful human race and each one of us has daily added more sins to the pile. So before God we are like that man in extraordinary debt and with no way of paying it. You know, one mortal sin is an infinite offence against God. So it's a, it's a debt, an offence, we cannot fix on our own. Probably the defining moment when someone really begins uh, to live as a Christian is when he or she takes in that, that reality. I am that man. I was in debt to God. I deserved eternity in hell for my sins. But in his tremendous mercy, I've received a second chance. The debt has been dealt with through the death of Jesus Christ. So I can get mercy, I can get forgiveness, if only I humble myself, fall on my knees and ask for it. And as Catholics, that means going to confession, because the priest is there as the representative of that master, in the place of the master, invested with the power to bind and loose. How I would love for each of us at a deeper level to grasp this reality. I am that person. And on the cross, Jesus dealt with that billion pound debt of mine so that I can have a chance of forgiveness and freedom. What an amazing image, that master forgiving the billion pounds worth of debt. What an amazing image of our heavenly father. 
But the ultimate point of the parable, the parable of the unforgiving steward, is that we should be so completely overwhelmed by the mercy of our Father, we should be so completely breathless at how he has treated us, that our whole lives should echo the forgiveness, the mercy, the amazing love of the forgiving Master. So how shocking it is that the servant will not forgive his fellow servant such a comparatively small amount, a hundred denarii. That's not loose change. You know, that's a hundred days work. It's quite a bit of money. But the servant's heart should be, should be moved by the mercy he's received. It should, be, it should be transformed by the mercy he's experienced. And so he should feel bound to treat his fellow servants in a way his master would approve of, in a way that's characteristic of him. If you allow yourselves to be overwhelmed by the mercy of God, forgiveness for others becomes easier. The more you think about how God has forgiven you by taking your sins to the cross and suffering for them, forgiveness becomes easier. Those trivial things your relative has done those years back, it becomes easy, easier to let go of those things. Forgiveness is not condoning what happened. It's not ignoring the demands of legal justice which may exist. Forgiveness is not pretending that the person who offended you is now a good person to have around. They might not be. Forgiveness is when you choose to let go of the bond that comes into being when you know someone has sinned against you. It's dropping a psyche, psychological hold that you've chosen to, 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 to grasp that person with. It's choosing to love the person and in loving them to pray for them, to pray for them and to pray that they too will realize how indebted they are to God so that their hearts will be touched, that they also will be changed, converted through encountering the overwhelming and undeserved mercy of God. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.